Uh, it's great to see uh, so many people here uh, on a, one of our first sunny days of the year. So um, um, hopefully it will be as attractive as going to the park uh, at lunchtime. Now, I couldn't possibly cover everything um, in Aftershock. It's 400 pages long. It covers all sorts of issues um, in just half an hour. But I'm going to try and give you um, a flavor uh, of what's in it. And it begins, of course, with the financial crisis, uh, which is uh, the worst uh, since the 1930s. But it's mainly about the world after the crisis, the, the dangers uh, and the opportunities ahead. And not so long ago, we looked set for another Great Depression. But unlike in the 1930s, governments rode to the rescue. They propped up the banking system. They slashed inter interest rates uh, to zero. They pumped loads of money into the economy and they injected a fiscal stimulus. And that certainly helped. But we were also lucky. We came perilously close uh, to financial Armageddon. And so at the start of the book, I traveled to Iceland, to, which uh, did actually suffer a depression, where the size of the banks was so large that they couldn't actually be bailed out by the government. And that, for me, uh, is a warning of where, what could happen to Britain uh, if we don't um, uh, fix our banking system. Yeah. OK. Now, here we are now. It's two years later. Bankers' bonuses are back. House prices are rising, 10% over the past year. All this while unemployment is rising, while debts are piling up, while frictions with China are growing, and while the planet overheats. And so the question that the book tries to answer is, is this really sustainable? And for me, the answer is yes, we do need to change course, because if we don't, we could suffer an even bigger crisis from which our over-indebted governments uh, cannot save us. Like Iceland, next time, our luck may run out. So where do we go from here? OK, so the three immediate priorities are fixing the banking system, they're improving public finances, and they're encouraging healthier and more balanced economic growth. And longer term, we need to adjust to the rise of China, India, and other emerging economies, and we need to tackle uh, climate change. So let's start with the banks. Our old friend Fred the, Fred the Shred. Now, at the moment, uh, the banks that we bailed out can borrow vast sums of money from the Bank of England at basically near zero interest rates. But instead of lending that on uh, to small businesses that need credit, instead of lending it uh, to the new companies which will provide future jobs and future growth, they're making easy profits, profits by buying government bonds or more speculative assets, safe in the knowledge uh, that if those investments go wrong, government, governments will bail them out again as they just have done uh, through the bailout package uh, for Greece. And this flood of easy money into the economy pumps up asset prices. You see house prices, you see share prices rising. But it does little uh, to benefit uh, the rest of the economy. So I think that in these exceptional times, when the government has a controlling stake in Northern Rock, in RBS, and in Lloyds, it should be directing them to lend more uh, to sound borrowers. And it should also ban all banks all of which benefited uh, from government guarantees, even, even banks like Barclays, which claim that they didn't, uh, from paying out bonuses and dividends until they've restored uh, their, their, their cushion of capital uh, to a level that can provide uh, an adequate protection against future losses. But most importantly, G20 governments need to get together and implement radical uh, financial reforms. Because it's absolutely unacceptable that banks which are deemed too big to fail, can gamble a public expense. Heads, they win, and tails, uh, taxpayers lose. Because capitalism without risk of failure is like power without accountability. It corrupts, absolutely. So the starting point is better regulation. You need to compel banks to hold a much larger buffer of capital that rises in boom towns to cut off uh, excessive risk taking. And what, once that in place, you need to pay bankers bonuses in shares that cannot be sold for a long time, so they lose out if their bets subsequently prove wrong. And to avoid, avoid future bailouts, banks have to be restructured so they can be wound up quickly uh, and uh, safely uh, if need be. Now, all of that's essential, but actually the problem is much bigger than that. 
Because even in the good times, these big banks are far too powerful. They're government-backed, they're riddled with conflicts of interest, and they abuse their privileged position as the gatekeepers of capital markets. Now they say, we make huge profits, it's a huge contribution to society. But actually, those monopoly profits are a cost to society. And as even the best regulation isn't fail-safe, in the event of a crisis, politicians would come under huge pressure to bail them out again. Now while the banks were on their knees, we missed an absolutely golden opportunity to break the stranglehold that finance has over our economy. And now that this monstrous state-sponsored kleptocracy is resurgent, the grip is going to be much harder to break. But it must be dismantled. So to increase competition, to curb banks' power, and to assure, ensure that they are allowed to, to fail, they must be broken up. It's what Franklin Roosevelt did in 1933 when he faced down the House of Morgan uh, and broke it up. Because this crisis has caused the worst recession in living memory, mass unemployment, and an alarming rise in government debt. The next one could threaten government solvency, the open world economy, and even liberal democracy. We must act now before it's too late. Now the second priority is to improve public finances. And so far the debate has, has focused almost exclusively on how fast we should be cutting the deficit. And yes, premature cuts could be counterproductive. The danger though is that the market is going to force the government's hands. The best solution would be set out a credible plan about how the deficit's going to be cut uh, over the next parliament while delaying actual cuts until the recovery is secure. But longer term, the much more important question is how the deficit is cut. Unwise spending cuts uh, and tax rises could throttle the economy and unfair ones could, could produce a political unrest. Fairness demands that public spending cuts spare the vulnerable, and cutting investment in infrastructure and lifelong learning is a false economy. And to prevent house prices from soaring and the waiting list for social housing from growing, we urgently need to build more homes. But the wisest way to cut the deficit is to accelerate already desirable reforms encourage people to retire later. Tax harmful things are like carbon emissions, and if you raise the tax rate as emissions fall, then you ensure a steady stream of revenue while stimulating clean tech industries and the green jobs of the future. And then you could have a global tax on financial transactions. And people say, oh well, it's unworkable. Actually, the G20 to get together, it is perfectly workable. And what is the objection to it? When you buy shares, you pay stamp duty on that transaction. Why on earth shouldn't larger financial transactions also be taxed? And then a bold government might also legalize drugs and tax them the same way that it does nicotine and alcohol. But by far the best way to make the tax system fairer and less damaging to the economy is to cut taxes on labor and to introduce a tax on land values. That could raise huge sums of money. The total value of land in this country is about five trillion pounds. A 0.5% levy would raise 25 billion pounds. That's as much as a five point rise uh, in income tax. It would also boost economic growth because when you tax work, it costs jobs and some people uh, work less hard. But land is in fixed supply. It cannot be spirited off uh, to a tax haven. And because infrastructure investment raises surrounding land values, a land tax could help pay for Crossrail or uh, a new high-speed high, high rail link, which otherwise might fall victim to short-sighted budget cuts. Most importantly, though, a land tax would be fair. I mean, we all think that you know, Brazil is, has an incredibly unequal land distribution. Actually, Britain's is even more unequal. A mere 0.3% of the population mostly hereditary landowners, own 69% of Britain. The country's biggest private landowner, the Duke of Buccleuch, he owns 277,000 acres. That's the equivalent of 277,000 football pitches. 
Not because he's particularly talented, not because he works particularly hard, but because he descends from a man who seized vast swathes of Scotland. Is he taxed? Is he hell? He gets handouts from Europe's common agricultural policy. And these land monopolists, as Winston Churchill dubbed them, get richer not through their own efforts, but those of others. The Duke of Westminster, he owns 300 acres of what were once fields. Now, they're London's priciest real estate, Mayfair and Belgravia. And because so many people like you have come here to London, worked, established thriving businesses, that inheritance is now worth billions of pounds. So surely, we should be taxing that windfall gain rather than the efforts of the employees and entrepreneurs who generate it. Now, fixing the banks, reforming the tax system are both essential parts of shifting Britain's, Britain's economy towards a healthier and more balanced pattern of future growth. Americans and Britons need to learn uh, to live within our means. A house is a place to live and not a cash machine. Our economy must rely less on housing and finance and more on the export industries of the future. In Japan uh, and Germany, they've been squirreling away nuts uh, for a rainy day. Well, now the storm has arrived. It's time to get spending. They need to rely less on exporting and more on developing sectors that service domestic needs. And all governments need to tackle the obstacles uh, that prevent the economy from adjusting, whether it's gummed up labor markets, whether it's entrenched producer interests, whether it's barriers to innovation and enterprise or misaligned currencies. Open up further to foreign trade, investment, and people. Encourage clean technologies. Help people uh, retrain and find new jobs. And make it safe for emerging economies uh, to tap global capital markets. Now, all of that won't be easy. The bubble mentality is incredibly hard to break. Even now, people are desperate to get back on the property ladder. And so are deeply ingrained uh, savings habits in places like Germany. Also, dominant financial interests in the city and on Wall Street will fight tooth and nail uh, to block reform. And so will the export interests that dominate in Germany, uh, Japan, uh, and elsewhere. But if we slip back into the bad old ways, if we inflate yet another bubble to rescue us uh, from the consequences of the last, it's all going to end in tears. Now, ultimately, a sustainable recovery can only come uh, from developing uh, new technologies and new businesses that create jobs and enhance productivity. And also, it will come from exporting to emerging economies uh, like China, India, and Brazil, where there is plenty of pent-up demand. Now, the incredible story about uh, this crisis is that whereas uh, advanced economies have suffered massively, emerging economies uh, have fared much better. In fact, they're leading uh, the world, out of the out of, uh, world economy out of recession. The green line there is the emerging economies. They're growing at 8% a year. And because they're growing so fast, the blue line, uh, the world economy, is growing almost as fast as, as it was uh, before the crisis. Now, by some measures, these emerging economies now account for more than half of the world economy for the first time since the Industrial uh, Revolution. And in the years ahead, they're likely to account for most of the growth in the global economy. And that's going to affect all sorts of things, from uh, global energy use uh, to how uh, the global economy is run. Inexorably, uh, the center of gravity of the world economy is shifting south uh, and east. Now, it's a tragedy, of course, that some people are not sharing uh, in the benefits of this growth. Life is still very tough uh, for the bottom billion uh, who live in states that are incapable uh, to deliver their basic needs, uh, let alone to tap into uh, the global economy. And they urgently need our help, as I discussed in my first book, uh, Open World. But for most of the developing world, life is looking up. In 1990, 63% of people in developing countries lived on less than $2 a day. Within 15 years, that was down to 47%. And remember that $2 stretches much further uh, in rural India uh, than it does in central London. An extra 1.2 billion have shifted up into the next bracket between $2 and $13. And by that standards, they're considered middle class. Half of the developing world 
is now middle class. And then you look at this incredible transformation. In India, average incomes have doubled between in, in 14 years, 1994, 2008. In China, they've multiplied by 10 since 1980. They've doubled since the turn of the century uh, alone. And to see how far China has come, you just have to go uh, to Shanghai. It's absolutely amazing. You arrive there, this maglev train, you whisk into, into town, it accelerates to 431 kilometers an hour in four minutes. Now compare that to the Stansted Express. Um, and then you get a cab across Lupu Bridge, which is a bit like Sydney Harbour Bridge. And you're, it's a bit like being on Blade Runner because the skyscrapers are so high on either, either side, you feel like you're kind of flying uh, through the sky. And then you catch sight of the, skyscrape, uh, the skyscrapers. Uh, you know, this is a, a vision, a, a mad vision of the 21st century. And this, 20 years ago, didn't exist at all. That was marshland. Incredible transformation uh, within just uh, 20 years. And, okay, China's not, Shanghai's not representative of China. London isn't actually of, of Britain either, uh, but it's still a, a window on the future. And then you look, actually, at how China has been transformed uh, over the past uh, 30 years. The middle class line is that red line there. You see that in 1980, nearly everyone uh, was below it. By 1995, you know, a fair proportion, those people in blue there, are above it. And you see now, in 2008, uh, more than half are there, and within 10 years, nearly everyone will be. That's absolutely remarkable in 30 years. It's the, it's the most rapid uh, uh, period of growth and in industrialization the world has ever seen. And then you say, well, three in eight people in the world live in China and in India. And their living standards are growing at 8% a year. If that continues, uh, for nine, it, they will double every nine years, and they will quadruple uh, every 18. And that means that by 2025, uh, the Chinese, who as recently as the 1970s were still starving in many cases, will be as rich as the Portuguese are today. And by 2035, so will the Indians. Now, for me, that's fantastic news because it offers unprecedented opportunities for billions of people poorer than ourselves to enjoy a better standard of living. And it will make the world a much fairer and a much safer place. And it could also benefit people in Britain and other rich countries. New jobs, new businesses, new technologies, a wider choice of better and cheaper imports. Brazil, for instance, could help feed the world. India's entrepreneurial companies are snapping up and turning around uh, Western ones. So you see uh, Tetley Tea, which used to market an Indian product, a product of colonization, uh, now has been taken over by an Indian company. Chorus, the, the old British deal likewise, Jaguar uh, and, and Land Rover. They've even bought um, a company uh, selling Scotch whiskey. And they're creating new jobs and better products uh, for everyone. Or you look at China, people say China doesn't consume enough. Actually, it's the world's fastest growing uh, consumer market. And any, any British company that can tap into that can prosper. The Chinese buy more cars and mo more mobile phones uh, than the Americans do. 15 years ago, there were hardly any Chinese tourists. Last year, 42 million traveled abroad. They spent 43 billion. Soon, they might be as ubiquitous as the Japanese became in the 1980s. And you look at the McKinsey Global Institute, and they say, well, over the next 15 years, Chinese consumers could generate nearly a fifth of global consumption growth, and as much of a quarter of it with reforms like creating a proper welfare state, with developing service sector uh, industries uh, that employ lots of people, and by allowing the currency uh, to appreciate. Already you can see that China's huge investment needs have transformed uh, the lives of people uh, in Africa, China is now Africa's main uh, trading partner. Britain's exports to China have more than quadrupled in the last decade. So when people say, well, where are the jobs um, going to come from? Isn't China going to steal all our jobs? Actually, many of the jobs in the future are going to be coming from selling to China, India, uh, Brazil, and other emerging economies. At which point you say, well, yes, that's fair enough. But if China and India uh, start trying to consume as much as we do, surely uh, the planet is going to fry. And it's at, at, at current technologies, the answer is yes, most probably it would. But many people respond to, say, to that by saying, well, shifting to a low-carbon a low economy requires us to give up all the trappings of modern life, or even to try to deny them to people 
uh, in uh, developing countries. Surely, though, it would be better to try to find alternatives uh, to carbon-based energy. Because if we tap the limitless energy of the sun, the wind, and the atom, then the false choice between growth and greenery is removed. Now, as part of the research for my book, I went uh, to Silicon Valley, uh, famous before uh, for uh, internet com companies, now at the forefront of clean tech uh, research. And one of the highlights of my trip around the world was taking a Tesla Roadster uh, for a spin. Uh, they go 0 to 60 uh, in four seconds, um, uh, they're in, in, and, um, but they make absolutely no sound. They have zero emissions because they're driven by lithium-ion batteries, the same ones uh, that you have uh, in uh, your, your uh, laptop computer. And the, the remarkable things about many of these clean tech companies is that they are powered often by Indian and Chinese brain power. And even more remarkable is that some of the leaders in clean tech are actually in China and in India. You might have seen on London streets these gee whiz cars, they're the little boxy electric cars. Uh, well, they're made by Riva, an Indian company. Or you see the global leader in electric cars is a company uh, called BYD, Build Your Dreams. Um, which makes also mobile phone batteries has now has branched out into electric cars. So if you say, well, as long as governments provide sufficient incentives now to invest in clean technology and a credible commitment to carry on doing so over the medium and long term, if investment continues to pour into clean tech research as it is, and some of the world's brightest minds and business people are competing to clean up and to change the planet, well then, Existing, existing technologies can become much cheaper, and new ones uh, can be uh, created. Just this week, for example, uh, the first flight ever was done of a, of a plane fueled by algae. Remarkable transformation. The, the seemingly improbable or implausible can become possible and then probable. And then if you think about it, if, if, if um, clean tech is cheaper or becomes cheaper uh, than fossil fuels, then it would be much easier to shift to a greener and, and uh, uh, to, 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 a, to, a, to greener technologies. Now, carbon-based energy has been a remarkable tool for human progress, but it's always had big downsides: smog, war, dependence on Nazi dictatorships, and now it endangers the planet. But what is really valuable are the unprecedented opportunities of modern living, an escape from drudgery in the home the mind-broadening delights of foreign travel, cool buildings uh, in hot countries, and the freedom uh, to go where we please. And their extension from a rich minority to the rest of the world is surely a cause for celebration, not despair. So instead of rejecting modern lifestyles or trying to deny them to others, the priority must be to try to find new sources of energy. And as Silicon Valley shows, the surest way to get there as quickly and as cheaply as possible is to keep economies open and allow people new ideas and new technologies uh, to spark off each other. Now, longer term, the challenge is going to be to adapt to this ongoing rise of China, India, and other emerging economies. And of course, there are going to be setbacks along the way. Development never goes in a straight line. But it's reasonable to expect that within the next 20 years, China will overtake America as the world's biggest economy. And that's going to require adjustments. The West can no longer boss the rest around, nor can it presume that it always knows best. But while the West's share of the global economy is going to shrink, we can all benefit from emerging economies' dynamism. Not just cheaper imports, but better ones. Not just imitated technologies, but innovative ones. People and ideas are moving in both directions. Now, we tend to think of immigration as movement to places like Britain or America. But actually, people are increasingly heading east as well as west and south as well as north. There are more Brits abroad than foreigners in Britain, and increasingly, they're moving to China. There are already more than 600,000 foreigners in China. That's 13 times more than 13 years ago. And they include Westerners working illegally. Whatever next, you know, Westerners are illegal immigrants. 
And migration is also much less permanent than before, because in the age of Ryanair and the internet, migrants often move again, back home or somewhere else. Three quarters of those who arrived in Britain in 1998 had gone again by 2008. And these newly mobile people are a bit like bees. They fly from flower to flower, cross-pollinating them. So perhaps we should jettison the word immigration and start talking instead about a kaleidoscope of mobility. And that promises a whole new world of opportunities for people, a wider and more flexible pool of talent for companies, and a proliferation of new ideas and businesses, both within countries and across global migrant networks. And globally, of course, it's still the privilege of the few. But within the European Union, uh, most and soon all of the 500 million people uh, can live and work wherever they choose. That's truly remarkable. Who would have thought 20 years ago that open borders from Estonia to Estepona would now be considered normal? And this remarkable experiment has shredded uh, many of the myths about allowing people to move freely. They say everyone would come. Actually, all 75 million people in Eastern Europe could have moved to Britain. At most, one million did, and most have already left again. Many move back and forth regularly, like international commuters. Society hasn't collapsed. Recent arrivals have more than paid their way, as UCR research shows. In fact, newcomers of all cultural backgrounds are twice as likely to start a new business as people born in Britain are. And if you doubt the economic benefits that newcomers bring, ask yourself this question. Would London be half as vibrant, be half as rich, without a constant influx of people, not just from around the world, but also from around uh, the country? And then think, well, Romania is poorer than Mexico. If freedom of movement works so well within the European Union, why wouldn't it work in North America and elsewhere too? Now, nobody could have guessed uh, when he arrived as a child refugee uh, from the Soviet Union uh, that Sergey Brin was going to go on to co-found Google. He's the one on the right. Had he been denied entry, America would never have realized the opportunity that had been missed. Now think, how many Sergey Brins does Britain, do Europe, uh, uh, turn away, and at what cost? Now, for now, prospects for freeing up global migration uh, might seem uh, bleak, but things could change. Because as baby boomers retire, they're going to stop worrying about who's going to take my job and start worrying about who's going to look after me if I need care. Young people like me who've grown up in a culturally diverse uh, background tend to be more open uh, to newcomers. Pragm pragmatism might also persuade. After all, surely it's better if people can cross borders legally and safely rather than risk their lives and then live in the shadows. And above all, we need to persuade people that preventing others from moving freely is an unacceptable violation of their human rights. Now, unfortunately, the crisis is producing an upsurge of protectionism, not just against products, but also against people. And we mustn't let, let that get out of hand, because the last time it did, in the 1920s and the 1930s, it took decades in a world war to open them up again. We mustn't make that mistake again. Now, the crisis has depressed not just our economy, but our mood. Many Europeans, many Brits worry that their best days are behind them. Many people want to hide away from the world, hunker down. The cheerfulness of the Chinese, the Indians, and the Brazilians only darkens the gloom. After all, how could we possibly compete? And yes, it's true. The present is painful. The future is full of danger. Another cycle of bubble, bust, and bailout. A Greek-style debt crisis. A retreat into protectionism and prejudice. A climate catastrophe. But if we fix global finance, if we reform the tax system, if we reshape the UK and world economy along healthier lines, open up economies and societies, and embrace a low-carbon future, then a fairer, safer, richer, and greener world is possible. Because the world is still rich with opportunities if we reach out and grab them. 
Until recently, we were tapping the brain power of only a tiny fraction of humanity. Wang Chuan Fu, the founder of BYD, the, the, the Chinese company making electric cars, he grew up on a farm in extreme poverty in a country uh, where enterprise was forbidden. And look where he's got now. So just think how much faster and further humanity could progress if Africa emulated China's success, if women were liberated in the Arab world, if people were set free to live and work wherever they choose, if Silicon Valley's entrepreneurial magic cast its, on, its, mag, its spell uh, on Europe, and if every young person uh, in Britain got a fair start in life. Now, Tom Friedman wrote a book called The World is Flat. But in reality, the world is anything but flat. The biggest determinant of your life chances is not how talented you are. It's not how hard you work. It's where you were born and who your parents were. And an open world made up of open societies that can help change that. Because it's not just a matter of breaking down barriers at the border. It's about breaking down barriers within society and changing people's attitudes. It's about combating discrimination, xenophobia, and exclusion. It's about embracing difference and change. And so for me, the new dividing line in politics is be between people who are in favor of dynamic, open, and progressive societies and those who want to close the doors uh, and turn the clock back. Open societies can create new freedoms, new opportunities, new ideas, greater variety and diversity, better lives in the broadest sense. In other words, progress. Which, as Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, put it, is about expanding the power to do things, the freedom and the capacity to realize your dreams. And that's why we also need progressive governments that enforce fair laws, that promote social mobility, that equip people for change, that catch us when we fall, and that break down the monopolistic bastions of land ownership and finance. Above all, though, we need optimism. The optimism to try to improve things, to invest in the future, to embrace change. The optimism that views challenges, even crises, as opening up new possibilities. Crises don't come much bigger than this. The pain is undeniable. The injustice, flagrant. The world is a desperately unfair place, but it is also full of promise. We would be mad to close ourselves off to its possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Um, so to kickstart the discussion, um, the first question, having read your book, there's some wonderful uh, stories of people that you've met uh, across the globe um, in India and uh, a variety of places. So with all those people there, who do you feel has the brightest future uh, in the next you know, 10 years economically? Um. Well, quite a few. Um, I met a Swedish guy who set up a company selling dental alloys in China. Um, so basically, he's making money out of um, giving uh, Chinese people a, a better smile. Uh, and he's, he's minting it at the moment. Um, he drives a Ferrari, um, so he's doing much better than I am. <laughs> then um, I met uh, this guy called Baba Kalyani. Uh, his father was uh, a penniless uh, peasant in India, uh, he set up a, his father set up a, company, a small business making agricultural uh, implements, uh, and his son has taken it to the next level. Uh, he, it, it's now um, the second biggest forgings company in the world. That means that they sell many of the parts that goes into um, uh, most uh, cars sold in Europe, which is pretty amazing. Um, I met Victor Ren, who was, who was born in um, uh, Inner Mongolia, which is the, the Chinese bit of Mongolia. Uh, and uh, you know, he was born uh, in uh, a, a city where they struggled to make ends meet, uh, where they, you know, they had to scrabble to find coal to heat themselves because it's desperately cold there in winter. Uh, and now he's moved to Shanghai, and, um, uh, and he's uh, building a better life for himself. I met Joanne Chen, 
uh, whose parents um, you know, almost died in the 1970s when there was no food. They were, they were reduced to like scrabbling and stripping bark off, um, off trees to try and survive. Uh, and now she has a job um, uh, working for a company selling light bulbs. Uh, and she dreams that her son, Jerry, um, will one day um, be able to drive a German car uh, and be able to travel the world. Um, so for them, you know, life is, life is um, definitely uh, looking up. But I think the main message of the book actually is that we shouldn't be, feel threatened um, by uh, the rise of China and India. It's something that anyone who has a shred of humanity should welcome uh, because we are extending the benefits of the Industrial Revolution from a tiny minority uh, to the many. Uh, but also, it's something uh, that can benefit uh, us as well um, because there is a whole new market for absolutely um, uh, all sorts of things and that British companies um, uh, can prosper uh, by exporting uh, to China.